As we're looking at the fruit of the Spirit, we're on kindness. There's a fine line, though, between kindness and love. The Hebrew word, I have it up there, hesed, uh, is used uh, often to translate loving kindness. And it's often used to, to translate, as translated as loving kindness. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Jesus actually tells us that there is a about loving kindness. This loving kindness of God functions like this. But love your enemies, do good to them, uh, and lend them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be son of the Most High. Because He is kind, listen, to the ungrateful and the wicked. We tend to be kind to people who are kind even to those who are unkind. You get the picture? In fact, the Bible says God demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were still sinners. It's not that we were lovely and nice and all dressed up and you know, cleaned up and, and wonderful people. He loves us and He's kind to us when we're not. Kindness. Loving kindness. Jesus said we're beyond uh, loving kindness. We're supposed to have this loving kindness to those who are not even loving. Kindness is really the opposite of sternness. In Romans chapter 11, the passage talks about how God had broken off Israel from the root of blessing. And uh, he had grafted in the Gentiles into the root of blessing. And he says, now consider therefore the kindness. God, God grafted Gentiles, us, who are not Jewish, to be in the line of blessing. He says, Consider therefore the kindness of God and the sternness. Well, the sternness are those that, is, that fell on those who were broken off. But kindness to you, provided that you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you will also be broken off. Kindness and goodness are the opposite of the sternness and the wrath. Now, the Bible tells us we wear pants. We wear pants. Therefore, as God's chosen people, if you know the Lord, you're one of His chosen people, holy and dearly loved of God, He says, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness. It's something you put on. You put on this kindness. And you get up in the morning, and if you're getting yourself ready, one of the things you want to put on is a happy face. Some of you spend hours in front of the mirror trying to get that happy face. <laughs> You put on kindness. He said, hey, you put this. It's something that you can put on. You wear it through the day. He said, people are looking at your life. Are you kind? Are you kind? You know, grouchy people, grumpy people, rarely have a good testimony for you. But kind, positive, smiling people, people tend to be attracted to them and listen to what they say. You wear kindness. You see, people, when you're wearing it, people see your kindness. But when the kindness and the love of God, our Savior, appeared, you see, when Jesus came, Jesus was kind. And you saw it in Jesus. The worst of sinners in the whole world flock to Jesus. Now get this picture. Jesus is the most holy person. He is so righteous. The thing is, he's not self-righteous. He is so righteous, you would think, because he is the light of the world, that darkness would not be attracted to him. But the people in the dark, they flocked to Jesus because Jesus in his holiness was not arrogant and self-righteous. He was truly righteous. And he was kind. He was kind. And it's the kindness of the Lord Jesus Christ that, that they saw and attracted people to him. They were attracted to him. The Bible says once you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have tasted the Lord's kindness. And it tastes good. It tastes good. Yeah. This last week, a couple of people have accepted Jesus as Savior. And both of them afterward, they just said, this, this feels so good because there's this wonderful taste of the Lord that He's forgiven my sins. He's pardoned me. He's given me eternal life. I have a future in heaven. I have so much. God accepts me. I'm accepted by God. It tastes so good. 
kindness tastes good. It tastes good. Now, kindness can be uh, influenced negatively. Uh, there's a guy here that, uh, he's the good guy. He's wearing the white hat. But it says, bad company corrupts good character. The Greek text actually says, bad company corrupts kind. You see, the people who are around me influence me. So I often tell young people, it's good for adults too, you need to hang around with people that are a step up, not a step down. Well, how about them? If I'm hanging around them, they're, I'm the, they're a step up. I'm the, I'm the guy that stepped down. And, well, that's their problem. You want to hang around with people who are a step up, right? You want to hang around with people who step up? Because bad company corrupts kind habits, doing kind things, the right thing. So, so you, you want to hang around with good people. That's why you want to come to church. And that's why the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourself together with other Christians because you need to be surrounded by kind people. It goes like this in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If I think like the people around me and they're stepped down, I become like them. If I think about like the people around me and they're step up, I become like them. So you need to surround your pe yourself with people who are truly kind in the biblical sense of the word. Thank you. You see, kindness can also be a positive motivator. He says, or do you, do you show contempt for the riches of his, that is God's kindness, tolerance and patience, not realizing that it is the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. You know, it's not getting in somebody's face and shouting and screaming at them that they're sinner and beating them with the Bible and telling them that they need to become a Christian. It is the kindness and goodness of God. When we share the love of God, people gravitate towards loving kindness rather than a proud beating of the Bible. When, when you share that Jesus loves you, that, that's far more powerful than trying to expose all the things wrong with them and how to get it right. It, when, when they come to Jesus, Jesus will make the changes in their lives. You don't have to beat them with that. Just allow Jesus through the Holy Spirit to work in their life, and it will happen. The changes will take place. It's the goodness of God that leads us to a changed life. I want to tell a story to illustrate what kindness is like, this really, this loving kindness. You know the story of David and Goliath. David was just a young boy. And he, he took the stones and he put it in a sling and he slung it and he dropped the giant and the giant fell down. And David was a hero and champion in Israel. When he came into the town, people said, hey, Saul slayed his thousands. And David slayed his tens of thousands. No, Saul was the king and, and he was just a, a shepherd boy. <laughs> but he killed Goliath and then the chapter after 1 Samuel 17, uh, it's chapter 18, and in chapter 18, Jonathan, King Saul's son, says he really loved David. These, they met, they talked, and it says he loved him as his, himself. And they made a covenant with one another, and, and so David and Saul, the king's son, have, have a relationship. Now, now, Jonathan is also a, a mighty man of war and valor. So you got these two warriors. One's a little older, Jonathan's older than David, but they really connected. Jonathan had slain 20 men single handedly, but with his armor bearer. Uh, he, he would knock them down, and the armor bearer would, would slay them. And then a uh, space fighting anchor. 20 guys. I mean, 20 against two. He, that's the kind of guy. We're talking about macho men here. And they had this relationship. And David loves Jonathan. Jonathan loved David. So much so it said, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Their hearts were united. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved his past himself. Later, the, later and, and, and conflict was developing between Jonathan's dad, Saul, and, and David. So David had to flee, and he gets together with Jonathan, and Jonathan says, but show me unfailing kindness. There it is. Show me that chesed, unfailing love, that unfailing kindness. Show me that. Like the Lord, like that of the Lord, as long as you live. 
this guy like making we were kids, blood brothers. You scratch your finger, you your blood, we're blood brothers. As long as I live, so that I may not be killed, do not cut off your kindness from my family. Not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. You know who David's enemies were? Jonathan's dad, King Saul. He's saying, hey, we're entering into a relationship here. And make a covenant with me. Promise that you will love me even when my family is all against you and they're all enemies. That you will show your same loving kindness to me then. Kind of like God. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hey, when, when my family is the enemy, still show the love. Still show this kindness. Kindness to me. If that's what we're through the book of Samuel, if you come to the next chapter for Samuel, and you find that Saul, the king, and his son, uh, Jonathan, they go off to war against the Philistines, and something happens in battle, and they both are killed. They die. The news comes back, and uh, uh, the news comes back to the family, and there's this guy. I've been telling Saul the introduction of the story about the Philistines. Now that's a mouthful. Try saying that like three times real fast, okay? <laughs> but the bishop, right? Uh, Jonathan had a son who was five years old. When the news about Saul and Jonathan's death came from Jezreel, and his nurse picked him up to flee, because you know what the thing was? Whoever would step in as the king would try to destroy all the heirs to the throne so that no one would be challenging him to the throne. And so Mephibosheth's life is in danger because he is an heir to the throne. Whoever is going to try to take the throne and the loss of, of Saul, this baby's in danger, this, this five-year-old child. So she scoops him up, she runs with him, the nurse picked him up and fled, but as she hurried to leave, he fell. I think she toppled on top of him. And, and he became crippled. Both feet were broken. Now you don't go to the orthopedic or prophetic the orthopedic surgeon. You can't, you can't go to the doctor to set your legs because there were none. There were none. And so he's going to develop to be a cripple. His name was Mephibosheth. Time passes. David is now established king, and uh, he's ruling. And uh, I want you just to imagine for a moment, though that you are Mephibosheth. You've grown to, you're now an adult. You're always on crutches because your feet are no good. You're lame, okay? And, and uh, you know that you've been in hiding for years. And you know that your father was an enemy to the guy who's not king. You're a doomed person. Now imagine how you feared. King David your whole life. Imagine. If I'm ever in this guy's path, he'll probably kill me. That's what you're thinking. That's my vision. One day, for some reason, David remembers, oh, Jonathan. Well, they were best friends. I don't know what it was that caused him to remember a best friend. He says, hey, is there anyone still left at the house of Saul? Now, could you imagine if, if you were and the word came back. He's asking about you. Oh my goodness. Your heart would sink. You would sink. He said, but is there someone still left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Is there someone in my enemy camp to whom I can still show kindness? For Jonathan. For Jonathan. That's the way it was with God showing kindness to us. God's kindness to us wasn't for our sake. God's kindness to us was for Jesus' sake. It's because of what Jesus did for us that God shows kindness to us. And David is he's a model of what, what God has done for us. He shows kindness for not a biblical sake. One of the servants says, there is still a son, Jonathan, of Jonathan, but he's crippled in both feet. Now, a cripple would never come into the court of the king. They just didn't allow him into the court of the king. You are an outcast. And so, 
the next thing we find is that David says, he summons him. Bring him here. And they brought him to King David. So when you arrive, because you're Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, you fall down and you, you pay homage to David. You know this. You've got to be trembling in fear of this one, this, this king. And David says, Mephibosheth, you said, you're, you're, you're your servant. You get the words out. David says, don't be afraid. He says to you, for I will surely show you kindness. I'll surely show you kindness. For the sake of your father. When I came to Jesus eight years old and I fell down and asked Jesus to be my Savior, I will show him kindness for the sake of my Savior. I didn't deserve it. He doesn't deserve it. You didn't deserve it. It is the kindness, the kindness of God. David says to him while he's, he's there on the ground, he says, and he's getting up, he says, I, I will restore you to the land. I will restore to you the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul. There's restoration. Now remember, his grandfather Saul was a king, so he's going to give them a lot of property. Wow, this is awesome. He's restoring him, and, and, and God restores us. When we come before him, we throw ourselves down before him, and God, who is kind, he says, I'm going to restore you to relationship with your Father in heaven. God is not out to get us. God is out to bless us. Why? Because he's a kind God. He goes out, he says, and you will always eat at my table. Now, it says, hey, king's table, so like a banquet every day. Hey, set one more plate. At, at, at this, the setting is going to sit Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth, as you read on in the story, he eats at the king's table the rest of his life. He, he's, he's eating at the king's table. I remember in Revelation, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and die. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him. And that's really interesting. And I will sup or supper with him and he with me. Well, he, you see, there's this whole notion of eating. It's where we get together, we eat, we talk, we fellowship. And this passage is saying this. Listen, I am going to restore what you lost in the fall from Adam. And I'm going to give you eternal life. And, and, and you're going to be in fellowship with me. We should be able to say, I know God. And I talk to God. God talks to me in His Word. And I have a relationship with God. I eat at His table. I feast on His food. And the Bible said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I feast on the Word. Here's kindness being illustrated. My Bibbishop bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? We do not become proud of the air. Puffed up, aha, I know Jesus, you don't. The Bible says God has chosen the base things of this world, the foolish things of this world, that he might confound the wise. If you're thinking you're pretty good, okay, just remember that God said you're the foolish, base thing of the world. So they might confound but you're not. He humbles himself before God and says, you know, it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. The only real worth I have is because Jesus has saved me. And I become very, very thankful. I'm still just a sinner. He's still just a dead dog, just raised by the king. Showing kindness. He says, I, and then King summoned Zima, that's uh, Saul's servant. And he says to Saul's servant, I have given your master's grandson, Mephibosheth, everything that belonged to Saul and his family. I've given him everything. Wow. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 1 that uh, God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I already have every blessing of God. There is heavenly places. The thing is, I still live on earth. So, positionally, I am seated in heavenly places, blessed in Jesus. Practically speaking, I'm still on earth. One day, 
when the Lord returns and takes me out of this world, I'm going to have my practical catch up with my position, and I am going to be blessed with everything that belongs to Jesus. Is that amazing? I have given your master grandson, Saul, son of Mephibosheth, everything that belongs to, to Saul's family. And you and your son shall be servants, uh, servants are to farm land for him. Hey, here's the deal. You give him all the land that, that he had. Mephibosheth can't work it. He's lame. So God said, no, no, so I'm going to give you everything you need to work the land. I'm going to give you servants, and they will bring in the bounty of the land. Do you know that when I accepted Jesus, God gave me everything I needed to become a productive Christian. He gave me the Holy Spirit that produces the fruit of the Spirit, of which is kindness. You can be a kind person. You just have to depend upon the Holy Spirit, who is who you have when you receive Christ as your Savior, to produce kindness. You see, that's kindness. This is the kindness we're talking about. This is the kind of kindness. Be kind, Paul says. Be kind. How? Like David with Mephibosheth. You find someone who is in great need, who doesn't deserve what you have to offer, and you bless them just to bless them. For the sake of the fact that God has blessed you. That's kindness. And it doesn't have to be somebody who's been kind to you. In fact, it's even better when they're not. That you are kind to that person. Be compassionate, the text goes on. Be kind and compassionate one to another. Like the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, you know the story. He, he took the guy that had beaten when the religious people had, had thrown him up by the wayside and said, oh, he's not worth our time. He bound up his wounds, he poured in oil. And, and, and the Bible says this, in the Greek text, it says that deep down inside he had this thing called spongna. Deep down inside he had compassion. It, it, it's, a, it's where spongna, you can kind of feel it right down in your gut. You know when you have that really terrible feeling in your gut? That because you see something that is it, just too horrific. You, you just edge slump. Now he has this down inside. He sees the man and he, he's moved deep down inside. And he, he, he starts to give the man what he needs, the medication, the help. Puts him on his donkey, he takes him to the end. He tells the keep guy there, take care of them. And, and if there's anything more, I'll pay it when I get there. You, you reach into your pocket and you help that person. That's kindness. That's compassion. He said, forgiving. Some of us, the kindest thing we can do is get rid of that grudge we've been holding for 20, 30 years. There's somebody who has offended you in some way. Maybe it's not that long. Maybe it's just last week. You're hanging on that. He says, forgiving. The word forgiving means to let go. You let go of it. Just let go of it. Just as in Christ, God let go. He forgave you. Just as He forgave you. Let go. That's kind of supply. How do you get that? How do you do that? How do you do that? You don't really do it. God the Holy Spirit produces it in you. That's the fruit of the Spirit. You see, it said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness. It's kindness. The Holy Spirit actually produces that when you walk in the Spirit. You're depending upon the Holy Spirit. You're in the Word. The Word is speaking through your life. You're, you're trying to live for Jesus. When you do that, the Holy Spirit produces it in you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a gracious, merciful, loving, kindness God. And that that kindness leads us to a changed life. May we just for a moment experience how wonderful and loving and kind you are. And then Lord, let that just flow out of us to touch some other lives. That through your loving kindness in us, other people might come to Jesus. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And
and we will remember that he is a kind God. Amen. And we're going to allow that kindness to flow through us. We're going to think of someone that we can be kind to today. Who doesn't deserve it. We're just going to be kind to that person. Today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, bless our refreshments that we're about to partake of. Bless us through the remainder of the day that we will remember that a God who was so kind to us that he let loose of all our debt, all our wrong, all the justice that we deserved and gave us pardon, forgiveness, and life. We too will be kind, forgiving others, just as you have done to us. Thank you for your kindness. Bless us in our day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's day.